Okay, you're here with Mr. Price and Fourth Hour. Uh, we are working on the EOC review for Unit 7. And what I'd like to do is show you some of the things that you may have forgotten that you need to remember here in the next few days. Uh, very simple stuff. First of all, I'm going to write down some genotypes. And I can come up with three different genotypes. And what a genotype is, it's a letter representation of genes. So if I go over here, remember genes, this is my awesome chromosome, just so you know. Chromatid, chromatid, held together by a central mirror. What we're talking about are this one segment of DNA in this chromosome is a gene. And what I've done is I've just given a letter representation of that gene. And remember, in us, we have to have two chromosomes for all of our um, chromosomes to make things work out. So again, if this is chromosome number one, pair, we got one from mama, one from dada. This one might be a capital T, and this one over here, which I'm writing now, might be a lowercase t. In that case, this genotype would be what's called heterozygous. And a heterozygous means that you carry both alleles, and allele is a, just a different letter representation. So this is allele to this one because they are both different genes. Um, in this case, this T might be dominant over the lowercase t, and we wouldn't see this lowercase t in a phenotype. The other one next to the, here is what's called homozygous dominant. And so I've got two words here. It's homozygous dominant because I have two capital T's, and those two capital T's both are that dominant trait. So homozygous dominant. And then the last one, the last possible genotype with what we have here, is what is called homozygous, and it's homo because homo means the same, zygous because it means gene, recessive. Homozygous recessive. So again, it's homozygous recessive because it has both lowercase t's and it is carrying both recessive um, genes. So in plants, if we were to set up like a little legend, tall would indicate the capital T and the lowercase t would indicate short. So the only way in this situation to get a short plant is to have homozygous recessive. That's the only way you're going to get a little tiny flower, let's say, in this case. And there's two ways then with genotypes to get um, a tall plant. So I'm going to draw a giant flower here. There's two ways to get a giant flower genotypically. You could have a heterozygous tall or you could have a homozygous dominant for tall, meaning it carries both dominant genes. This one carries the dominant gene. It hides the recessive T, so it's kind of hidden in this case. The only way you get a short plant is to have both genotype or both recessive to get that phenotype recessive plant. Okay, so with all that giant mess that we just made, let's change it up and go to what we're talking about here. So, what are we talking about? Um, we are talking about uh, the work of Gregor Mendel and how he took pea plants and looked at tall and short and some of these traits and discussed how all organisms inherit traits. And pea plants were really nice because they were really simple. It was either this or it was not. It was either tall or they were short. They either had green pods or yellow pods. And it was really simple to see this in plants. Um, all organisms work on these rules that McGregor Mundell came up with, but it's um, a little bit more complex than that in some organisms. So, uh, to review, the law of segregation means that two alleles for a trait will segregate or separate when gametes are formed during my meiosis. So again, if we represent um, these with letters, so if this is my uh, green pod, and I'm going to give it a capital G. And this guy has a lowercase g. And in fact, their genotype is GG and homozygous dominant and homozygous recessive. We're going to see all of these offspring become this, heterozygous. And this shows that each one of these Gs 
during meiosis, the dominant G's, the recessive G's, will all separate or segregate independently from each other. So just think of these as sperm and egg cells. Each one of these genes will separate from each other and that gives us the possibility that every single one of them will be this. So to draw a quick Punnett square here, you take a monohybrid cross, which is what this is. Dad, remember again, was dominant G, dominant G. So I'm going to put my dominant G's there. That's an awesome G, by the way. Dominant G there. And then I'm going to put my recessive G's here where you can see them. Recessive G. That's the law of segregation. Where these, all these letters will separate from each other. And then when I, get, when I put them back in the box, is all of them will be heterozygous. Capital G, lowercase g. Capital G, lowercase g. That's an awesome G, just so you know. And the last one also is capital G, lowercase g. So that's the law of segregation. Okay, so the next part is the law of independent assortment. And the law of independent assortment says that just because you have green pods doesn't mean you're going to have yellow seeds. Just because you have yellow pods doesn't mean you're going to always get green seeds. These two traits are independent or separate or different from each other and they do not and will not influence each other. So you might see green pods and most of you probably have green pods with green seeds. But you also might see yellow pods with yellow seeds and you might see all kinds of mixtures of these things and that happens because the law of independent assortment. An example in humans is um, just because you have blonde hair doesn't necessarily mean you're always going to have blue eyes. There are lots of people with blonde hair and brown eyes and blonde hair and green eyes. That's the law of independent assortment in us. Each one of our traits independently assorts or has nothing to do with the other trait and is it's not influenced during that trait. So that's a slight review of the law of segregation and the law of independent assortment. The law of dominance we've kind of talked about um, a little bit already. The law of dominance just basically means that one gene can be dominant over another gene. So in our simple example, the dominant T hides or covers up or beats up or whatever you want to say, the recessive. So if you have a heterozygous organism, we cannot see this recessive gene. It's hidden, it's masked. The only way to get that phenotype for tall to come out where we can see and phenotype again means physical characteristics for this little short flower that is the best flower ever. The only way to get that or see that phenotype is to have both recessive T's and that's called homozygous recessive. So again if you have dominance there's no way that recessive can be seen. So obviously you got two recessive that's going to be two dominants you're going to see the dominant gene. If I have a heterozygous Again, that dominant T mass or hide that recessive T. The last one I want to kind of talk to you about is the law of probability that um, Gregor Mendel came up with. And basically what we are measuring when we have Punnett squares is the possibility or the likelihood that an event will happen. And each event, and the way I'll put this to you, each time that we go through meiosis and um, have offspring, each event is independent, meaning the same chances are still there. For example, if we draw a Punnett square here again, and we're looking at a monohybrid cross, and let's do something a little different here. Let's do pods, so we need a key over here. Let's uh, get a key. So let's say pod color. So dominant G is green pods, and I'm going to put a P for pods. Recessive G is yellow pods. And what you'll see is if, and it doesn't matter what we cross here, let's just cross two heterozygous. So we're crossing this parent with that parent. And we're going to segregate the alleles. So segregate the different genes. And then we recombine them. What we're making is a probability chart that potentially we will see in the offspring. So if this mom, and this dad mated, these are the possibilities of their offspring. We could have a homozygous dominant green pods, we could have a heterozygous green pods, and the, and the numbers end up being three to one. So three chances to get green pods, 
phenotypes and one chance to get um, homozygous recessive or a yellow pod. So the chances of getting a yellow pod are slimmer. Now, if these two were to mate again, let's say, the chances of them getting, let's say the first time they mated, they got this guy. Well, this does not influence the next time. So basically we'd have to redraw that Punnett square and it, the probability are the same again. We're still gonna have the chance of three to one. And this first event, first offspring, has nothing to do with the next time, and so on and so forth. So it's just like flipping a coin. The probability of getting heads is 50%. Um, if you're trying to get two heads in a row, you would take those and measure them together. And what you're gonna see is, let's say we're gonna have 50%, which is one half. And then I'm gonna take the next attempt, because I'm trying to get heads twice in a row, and I'm gonna multiply those. So it's 25% or one quarter uh, chance of getting heads twice in a row. And if I want to do another event, I would just add another half because of the coin. And eventually the odds are just going to get slimmer and slimmer because each event is independent from each other. Okay, so again, the way something looks is its phenotype or its physical characteristics. So that is the fish. How that happens is the genotypes. The genotypes again are homozygous dominant, heterozygous, homozygous recessive, and they are going to give us or tell us what are the possible phenotypes? So genotype are the genes, which that's what geno means. And the phenotype is the physical characteristics of what something looks like. Incomplete dominance is where sometimes they're not completely, genes are not completely dominant over any other. Incomplete dominance means that you'll kind of have more of um, a blending of the traits. So what you'll see is one allele is not completely dominant over another. The example of that is what happens in snapdragons. We have a dominant red and kind of a, um, not a recessive white, but what happens when we mate these two is we get incomplete dominance. We have a blending of the two traits and we end up with pink snapdragons. That's a um, incomplete dominance. Sometimes uh, things have multiple alleles. Um, the best one is blood type. You have type A, you have type B, and you have type O blood. Well, that happens because there's three different or multiple um, alleles or multiple genes. You could have um, an A, you could have a B or you can have an O and there's some dominance here. A is dominant over O, B is also dominant over O, but the way to get type AB blood which shows both traits is you have type A gene and type B gene and both are shown. Again this is a type of multiple allele. Okay so real quick review of uh, dihybrid cross. This is crossing two traits. Remember the law of segregation, we're going to separate the two R's from each other, we're going to separate the two Y's, and we've got to represent every possible combination of dominant R, dominant Y. So we'll start putting those possible combinations, and notice that they're all different possible combinations from both parents here. So dominant R, dominant Y, dominant, recessive, recessive dominant, and then the recessive. Notice the probability here. There is one in 16 chance of getting both are all recessive traits. Uh, there's probably more probability of getting at least two of the dominant traits. So if you're betting, betting you want to put your money on um, both dominant traits being shown in the offspring. So again, this is a dihybrid cross. Uh, last thing I want to remind you of, remember this is Gregor Mendel and he studied the inheritance of traits in all organisms. Um, and I hope that this helps.